Our reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Let us hear the words of the Lord. But on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told them this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up, ran to the tomb. And bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. This is the word of God that is spoken for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Well, there is a story about a young boy by the name of Harold, and Harold had a very bad case of ADHD. And that meant that he didn't pay attention very well in his kids' ministry class. Each Sunday, he would constantly be moving around and bouncing off the walls, but they would do the best that they could with Harold. Well, on the week before Easter, his teacher brought in some of those plastic colored Easter eggs and and she gave one of the kids each of those eggs and she told them, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take these home and, and I want you to fill it up with something that would be a reminder of Easter. And then I want you to bring it back next week and we'll talk about it. And so the next week came around and they all brought their Easter eggs back and, and Susan had a spring flower in her egg and Joey had a cross and Jackie had a plastic butterfly. But just as she expected, Harold didn't have anything in his egg. And, and so she was a little surprised he actually even brought the egg, but he had it. And so she began to go around the room and she would comment on the different things that were in each of the eggs. And she didn't say anything about Harold's egg. And, and after a while, this kind of bothered Harold. <laughs> and so he piped up and, and said, Mrs. Wilson, you didn't say anything about my egg. And she looked at him a little confused and said, but, but Harold, you don't have anything in your egg. There isn't a reminder of Easter there. And he said, yes, there is. It's empty, just like Jesus' tomb. Over the last six weeks, we have been in a series that has been called Final Words. And throughout this series, we have explored each of the seven final statements that Jesus spoke as he was hanging and dying on the cross for our sins. We heard him speak a word of forgiveness as he said, Father, Forgive them, they know not what they do. We heard him speak a word of salvation to the thief that was hanging next to him. As he said, today you will be with me in paradise. We heard him speak a word of compassion and care as he looked at his mother and said, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. We heard him wrestle with his sense of forsakenness as he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We heard him wrestle with his thirst for the presence of the will of God. And and we saw him declare his desire to see God's will accomplished in his life. As he cried out, it is finished. And last week we saw him die with a prayer of trust and surrender. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. For three days between Good Friday and And Easter morning, darkness covered the land. There was nothing but silence. And I want you to take a minute today and to step into 
the disciples' shoes. And imagine what it would have been like for those three days as they were wrestling with the loss of Jesus Christ. I mean, can you imagine what it must have been like to, to be, you know, experiencing the sense of loss that they were dealing with? I mean, they, they had been with Jesus now for almost three years, following him everywhere they went. They had left behind everything to follow this man. They had left behind their family. They had left behind their jobs. They had left behind their sense of livelihood. They had left behind everything to follow him around the country for the last three years, listening to his teaching. But now it looked like everything was over. Right now, it looked like it was done. It didn't look like there was any way forward anymore. Because now he was dead and all their expectations and all their dreams and all their hopes and wishes for what might have happened were gone. I mean, none of them could have expected what was going to happen as the women walked to the tomb on that first morning. They had no concept of, uh, of someone raising to life in the middle of history. Right? This wasn't something that ordinarily happened. I mean, when was the last time that you saw somebody raised from the dead? Right? This isn't the kind of thing that normally happened. And even though they had a, a faith that taught them about the resurrection of the dead, it was always a spiritual resurrection at the end of time. A resurrection into heaven. And apart from those three people that Jesus had raised from the dead, it, it, this has been something they had never seen, never encountered, never experienced before. Because when you die, you die. I mean, it, for them, on those three days, that was it. It was final. It was, it was over. There was no possibility for anything else. There was no possibility for hope. The, the final word that Jesus spoke from the cross for them was the last word. And I want you to, to notice the mindset of the women as they're walking to the tomb on that morning. We, we see what's going on in their minds through what they do, right? Through the, the things they say. And, and so they're walking to the tomb. Their, their actions are defining their beliefs and they're setting out. And look where they're going. They're going to a tomb, right? right? They're going to a cemetery. They're going looking for a corpse so they can embalm his dead body. They're weeping, they're crying, they're, they're in sadness, they're in grief, tears are filling their eyes, and the angels ask him this radical question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? But the thing was, they weren't looking for the living. Right? They had come here looking for the dead. They had come to this place looking to anoint his body. And, and even when they saw the, the stone rolled away, they, they still walk inside and they look around and, and, and the Bible tells us that they are puzzled by what they see. Right? They're confused. They, they don't understand what is happening in this place. And in the Greek, that term actually is a medical term that means the babbling of an insane person. <laughs> Right, that they're looking out, so they're, they're, they're confused, they can't connect the dots, they're, they're at a loss of what has happened, and so they, they go back and they start to tell the disciples, and, 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 and the disciples look at them and they say, this, this doesn't make sense. Right, these people are crazy, they're, they're insane. It, it, this isn't the way that the world works. And so they go to get up and check for themselves, right? Because for them, it didn't make sense. Or we see it in the story that happens right after this, the road to Emmaus. There's these two of these men. They're, they're walking along, and Jesus, Jesus comes up alongside them, and they're, they're walking, and they're talking, and they're telling Jesus about all the things that had been happening over the last few days. And, and they say, we had hoped he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. 
We had hope, right? It, it's past tense language. We had, we had hope because the thought was it, it's, it's over now. It, it, the, there's no way forward. Right? Even doubting Thomas, right? We all know that story, right? He, the, Jesus finally shows up and Thomas isn't there and the disciples start to say, we've seen Jesus. <laughs> we, we've seen the Lord and, and Thomas says, I'm not going to believe it. Right? It doesn't make sense. If I don't see the holes in, it, in his hands and the, the, the spear mark in his side, then there's no way I'm going to believe. Right? Because for them, he was dead. It doesn't make sense. And, and I want you to get this because we have become so desensitized to hearing that Jesus has risen from the dead that we don't grasp how radical this really is. Right? If we don't grasp that he was really dead, then, 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 then it, the, the power of the resurrection isn't there. It's because he did something that no one had ever done before. Right? That he defeated death once and for all, that we have hope. Amen. We have to put ourselves in their shoes because we've heard this year after year after year after year and familiarity numbs the senses, right? Where this is about as common as getting up in the morning. <laughs> but this should be something that shocks us. Yes. Right? This is radical <clears throat> news. That Jesus has risen from the grave. That he is not dead. That he is not here. You see, here's the message of Easter. Right? The final word is from the cross is not the last word. Right? The final word that Jesus spoke is not the end, right? Death is not the end. There is another word. There is a next word that, that on that morning the, the angels declare he is not here. He is risen. The death does not have the final word in this story. Death does not have the final word in our life. Hopelessness does not mark the end. It's only just the beginning. Because Jesus Christ has broken forth from the grave. He is alive. He is risen. He is not here. There is still hope. Amen. Adam Hamilton puts it like this in his book, Final Words. He says, after Jesus spoke his final word from the cross, he breathed his last and he died. But these words from the cross were not to be Jesus' final words. The powerful and joyous message of Easter is this, that there were words after that. I'm reminded of a story. It comes out of the life of the great Michelangelo. And, and one day he was out and he was looking at all of the work of his fellow artists. He was going from gallery to gallery to gallery, looking at all the things that they had done. And, and after some time of do, doing this, he just got angry. And, and he cried out to them and said, why do you fill gallery after gallery after gallery with endless pictures of Jesus on the cross? Why do you focus on that passing moment as if it's his last one? And he said to them, focus not on his defeat, focus on his victory. Right? Focus on the resurrection. Focus on the fact that he has triumphed, that he is risen again, that the cross did not contain him. That he is risen from the grave. I mean, notice how this story begins. I mean, unfortunately, not all of our English translations capture it really well, but in the Greek, the first word is but. But. And that's a powerful word. But, right? It, Jesus was dead, but. Right? The, he was in the grave, but. It was over, but, 
right? The, but is a powerful, powerful word. In fact, there is three times in this text that we hear this word, but. But on the first day of the week, but when they entered, but the men said over and over and over, we hear this declaration, but it was like this, but now it's different. Everything has changed, right? There is a powerful, powerful declaration here because but says that something is different about our experience. That what was is now no more. That the hopelessness and the death of Good Friday is over. But, right, it's a new beginning. It's a new beginning. I love how 1 Corinthians 15, 55 puts it. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? And the applied answer to that is death doesn't have a victory. Death has no sting because Jesus Christ has broken forth from the grave. And we have the victory. We need not fear. You see, he was delivered into the hands of sinners and crucified, but that was not the end because on the third day he got back up out of the grave. And so what's that mean for us today? I want to suggest two things. First is this, that even if it looks hopeless, there it is, even if it looks hopeless and dead, there's still hope. Even if it looks hopeless right now in your life, there is still hope. There is still hope. I mean, just look at this story again. The women, the disciples, the men on the road to Emmaus, Thomas, they all had given up hope for them. There was no way forward. But there's still hope. Right? And, and I think that we can relate to that because we've all been in those situations where it looked like there was no way forward. Right? We've all been in those situations where it looked like hope was gone. Maybe it was the loss of a loved one. Maybe it was a hard medical diagnosis. Maybe it, it was some financial issue. Maybe it was the uncertainty of a job or a future or, or, or a world that we're in. And we look at it and we, we say, it just doesn't look good anymore. And, and we start to think that there's no hope and there's no way forward. But you see, I have some good news for you today. The resurrection says that if it's dead, if it looks dead, if if it seems hopeless, if it looks impossible, it doesn't have to stay that way. Because Jesus has broken forth from the grave. You see, those places are actually the places where God does his best work. Right? Those are the places where God shows his mighty hand and he breaks forth from the grave. He's risen to bring hope into the deadest, driest, most hopeless places that life has to offer. Even into the graves of our life. And so I wonder, as you look at your life right now, what are the dead places that you need Jesus to do some resurrection work in? What, what are the hopeless places? What, what are the places where you'd say, I just don't see any way forward anymore. What tombs are you staring right in the face? Because those are exactly the places where Jesus wants to bring resurrection life. Don't get stuck in the tragedy of this moment and lose sight of the resurrection that is around the corner. Right, as that old sermon says, remember, it's only Friday, but Sundays are coming. Right? It's not over. There is still hope, even in the most hopeless places of life. And then secondly, death is not our final destiny. That our true destiny is eternal life. It's eternal life. I want you to think about it this way. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. What's a wage? 
Right? Think, you think about work, right? You go to work, you, you work in order to earn a wage, right? You, it's something that you earn because of something you've done, right? So if you think about a wage, the Bible says that our sin earns us a wage, and that wage is death, right? This is what we see all the way back to the, the beginnings of Scripture, that death is the thing that we deserve, right? We see it in Genesis 3. Right? When, when God shows up to Adam and Eve after they have eaten from the forbidden fruit, and immediately there's a death. As they're expelled from the Garden of Eden, there's a, a spiritual death, right? They're separated from the presence of God, but then later on there's also a physical death that takes place. Right? We get a couple chapters in, Genesis chapter 5, the very first genealogy in the Scripture. And the one thing that it says over and over and over about every single person in there is that they died. (laughs) Because the wages of our sin is death. It's what we deserve. It's what we've earned. At one point, that was our destiny. But because of God's great love for us, he chose to do what we couldn't do. He sent his son Jesus Christ into this world to suffer and to die for us. To take the penalty that we deserve. To pay our wage as he died on the cross for our sins. And then three days later, he got back out, up out of the grave And because of that, we are now forgiven and our destiny is his resurrection life. I want to illustrate it for you like this. There's a story of a little boy and him and his father were out driving one day. They were out in the country and there's a nice, beautiful spring day. They had their windows down when all of a sudden a bumblebee flies into the car. And the boy starts to panic because he's deathly allergic to bumblebees. And he's screaming, he's crying out. The the dad reaches out his hand, he grabs the bumblebee, he squeezes it, and then he lets it go. And immediately the boy starts to panic again. And his dad says, look here. See, I've taken the sting for you. You don't need to fear anymore. I've taken the sting for you. Jesus has taken the sting of sin and death. He has died the death that we deserved. And he didn't stay that way so that now our destiny has changed. That we have eternal life. It reminds me of one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It's found in Matthew 27, a very short episode just right after the death of Jesus. It's one of those moments that's so short we almost overlook it, but it's profound. Here's what it says, Matthew 27, 52 and 53. The bodies of many holy people who who had died were raised. After Jesus' resurrection, they came up out of the graves and they went into the holy city where they appeared to many people. See, it's a vivid picture that reminds us that His death is our death, and his resurrection is also our resurrection. That just as he got up out of the grave, we too will get up out of our graves and experience life eternal because our destiny has changed. And so how do we respond today? It's as simple as A, B, C. A, we admit. We admit that we're sinners that we are deserving of death. B, we believe. We believe by faith that Jesus has died for us, that he has paid the penalty for our sins, and that we are forgiven of all of our stuff. And C, we confess, and we throw ourselves fully on his grace that we might experience his resurrection life. And so maybe there are some of you here today that you've heard this message 50 times before, 100 times before, every year of your life, however long that has been. And you would say, I've never actually said yes to the resurrection life. I want to encourage you to make today today. Maybe there are some of you who this is the first time you've ever heard the message of the power of the resurrection. And I want to encourage you to say yes to Jesus today. 
that there might be this shift in your destiny as well. So if you would say in this place that that message is for me, I want to encourage you before you leave today to come and talk to me so that we can pray for you. You're also going to have communion in a little bit, and you're welcome to come and pray at the altars here. Uh, It's this place of God's grace. So let's pray. Jesus, we come to you to say yes, to say that we're willing to receive it, to say that we're admitting and believing and confessing you, Jesus, because we are grateful for what you've done. We couldn't have done this on our own, no matter how hard we tried but we know that the promise is in you. Maybe there are some in this place today that have some dead places that need resurrected. I pray that you would speak into those places today, Lord, to bring hope where hope looks like it's gone. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. He's risen. He's risen indeed. Amen. On the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took simple, ordinary bread. Each of Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then again after supper, he took the cup and he raised it to heaven and gave it to each of them to drink. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so as often as we eat of this meal and we drink of this cup, we proclaim a great mystery that Christ has died, that Christ is risen, and that he will come again. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and grape juice. Make them to be for us the body and blood of our Lord may be your people bearing your resurrection life to this world. Amen.